Uh, so welcome everyone to um, the impact tool, how to use your community's carbon footprint to foster action. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, muting would be fantastic. And a little reminder, if you're um, not members of the Herefordshire Green Network, we offer absolutely everything that we do for free, the lot. Um, but we do really, really, um, we're really, really, really thankful for our members. And if you are um, a student, it ranges from five pounds all the way up through to, to wage people and not-for-profit organizations. And local councils can join for 50 pounds for an annual fee, which is pretty reasonable considering all of the content that you get. And obviously the use of the great collaboration um, and all of its resources. So I'm just putting that out there at the beginning. And we are really, really lucky to have um, Tim Yeah here with us, who is the Regional Senior Energy Projects Officer of the Midlands Energy Hub. And he has been instrumental in the development of the Carbon Impact Calculator, which we've obviously been promoting for some time now. And lots of our local council members are actively using this tool. And there's been quite a few changes recently. So Tim's going to talk us through some of this um, and there'll be plenty of opportunity for um, questions. Tim, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Tim Yeah. Um, I work for the Midlands Energy Hub. Um, the Energy Hub is actually paid for by AIS, by the Government Department of Business and Industry and Industrial Strategy. Um, my role is primarily to support the local authorities and the local economic partnership to deliver energy projects throughout the region. Um, my area of responsibility though is the marches, so I'm, I'm entirely focused on, uh, on Herefordshire, and Shropshire and Telford and Reeking. Uh, it does confuse people that I'm with the Nottingham City Council uh, web, the email address, but that's purely for admin purposes, really. I actually live in Leinster, so um, uh, I'm actually a parish council on uh, Humber and Stoke Pride Group Parish Council as well. So I, uh, I know where you're, where you're all coming from. I actually use the footprint tool to start um, educating the people of uh, my parishes to do what their footprint is. And hopefully we're going to start working towards getting something done about it. So I, I'm very much coming from, from where you are. Um, and I, I just wanted to see if we can just talk through the impact tool, just to sort of give you an idea of, of, of why we use it, how we use it, uh, and what it can uh, what it can deliver for you. Um, right. So first of all, I just wanted to give a, a bit of a brief catch up, really, as to, to carbon footprints. Um, there are carbon footprints, and there are carbon footprints. They're all very widely used and they've been used for a long time. I've been working in uh, with local councils for many years trying to get them to understand their carbon footprints. Um, perhaps they are, there, are, there are different ways of calculating them and there are, there are ways of uh, reporting on them. And it all gets a little bit muddled and confused as to, to which is the best footprint calculator to use. So, what I'd say right from the start is that all footprint calculators, whether it be Impact Tool or any of the others that exist for um, big authorities or nationally all the way down to individuals' footprint tools, they are guides. They're not gospel. Um, they, they, can't, they can't be unless you give them absolute 100% of the information they can possibly need to calculate it. So they can only ever really be guides. So we need to make sure um, make sure that uh, we, we, we think of them as that. Are you, are you, is everybody hearing me okay? I've sometimes had problems and they're not. Well, I'm, I'm surprisingly hearing you okay. My internet's normally terrible. Um, it's quite robotic, apparently. You're more yeah, than welcome. I just saw that. Yeah, you're more than welcome to come out and come back in again if you want to try that. Um, well, if I try holding the mic differently, does that help at all? Or? Is that still, oh yeah. I think, I think we're fighting nature here. <laughs> There's a storm. Possibly. I will, I will just pop back out and see if I can come back in again. Yeah, Hold let's on a try second.
it might be worth everyone um, making a note of any questions that you want to ask as we go along. I'll keep an eye on the chat, obviously, but I'd imagine that uh, they'll crop up fairly frequently. Here we go. All right, does that sound any better or am I still sounding a little bit dodgy? Nah, we'll be okay. I think at least we've tried everything we possibly can now, so yeah. we'll just leave it up to the gods. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Um, okay, right. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was basically saying, right, that it is a guide. It's not, it's not gospel. Um, and it really does depend on which one you look at as to, uh, to what your footprint will be. I guess the other takeaway point is it's very difficult to compare footprints which are calculated using a different method. Purely because you're going to be capturing different bits of data from different data sets. Um, so it's important when you choose one to sort of stick to it and then you can start to have a, have a better look at uh, comparisons between parishes or between your own parish over, over a period of time, etc. So what the impact then? Well, impact was conceived as an idea uh, a few years ago now actually, to actually look at um, footprints of parishes because it was recognised that at the national level, we've got quite good ways of calculating the territorial emissions at the national level and individuals can do their own in a consumption way quite well as well. But there was a big gap in between right, when we started looking at um, anything smaller than a local authority. The data just wasn't granular enough to actually really understand what it was really showing. So impact was, was conceived to try and fill that gap. So it's actually it's a very, very complicated thing to do because we have to draw data from over 30 different data sets, um, some of which are looking at individual behaviours, some of which are taking national data and are pushing it down to, uh, to the sort of local level. So it, it, there is a lot of work that goes behind the scenes to make these calculators. The other important thing I think we need to, to consider is the, um, uh, the, the different types in terms of territorial consumption. These are two terms that I'm going to be talking about a little bit tonight, so useful just to make sure that we understand what I'm meaning by that. So territorial emissions is generally what is reported at the national level. Um, it really is looking at all the emissions that are occurring within a geographical area. So it doesn't really matter where the produce that's been produced by that is actually being used, it's where the energy is reused within, uh, within that geographical area. Alternatively, the consumption-based um, footprint is looking at all the emissions that are caused by residents doing, carrying out their everyday lives, um, no matter where the emissions for that have actually occurred. So if you're buying something in from abroad, the emissions from where you've purchased that are, are calculated within your consumption footprint. So they're very different things. Um, they both have very good uses, um, so they're both needed, but you can't really um, compare the two. So you should use both, but shouldn't really consider them in the same uh, in, in the same space. Um, so in terms of what we've done for the, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully this doesn't uh, cause everything to, to go completely haywire. Um, right. So the impact tool, can, can everybody see that? Yes, I've got a thumbs up, right, brilliant. So this is the, the home page of the impact tool. Um, it really is, we've tried to make it now as simple as possible. And this is one of, these are some of the work that's been done since it was launched in 2021. I should say that a lot of the work behind this, as you probably already know, has been done by um, CSE, the Centre for Sustainable Energy. They've done a lot of work on, on this over the last couple of years with the help of Exeter University. The funding for the majority of this has come through BASE, uh, it's all, and it's also had the support from the Midlands Energy Hub. 
We've also sort of been in support and, uh, from other parts of the, uh, the country now, and there's, there's some uh, charity funding done into this as well, just to make it uh, work for, for, for more people. So it was launched in 2021, designed to help local communities. And there were, there were a few main points that we asked it to be. We wanted it to be easy to use. It needed to be, um, the, the platform that it needed to be on needed to be accessible. There was a lot of talk at the start about it being an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but that would have made it really complicated for people to use. So we, we went for a website. We wanted it to allow comparisons between areas. Um, so that was another key thing that we wanted to do. We wanted to, importantly, to have reliable data. There was a lot of very unreliable data out there. We wanted to sort of minimize that and make sure that it came from trusted resources. So we gone for mostly UK government data and also data from uh, from a piece of software called Mosaic, which is looks at household level expenditure and, and details for, at that level. So by combining a sort of like a top down and a bottom up approach, we get to, to do the impact all. And importantly, we also needed to enable the targeting of actions. That's got to be the best outcome of, of this. We needed to get to that point. And we have seen a lot of interest has been generated by the tool. There's, Thousands of people have actually really logged on and are, are actually using it. Hundreds of councils across the UK uh, are now using it. So I just thought I'd um, quickly talk you uh, through some of the new additions. So we've had a general improvement to the uh, user interface. So this is what you see now. Um, initially, it was a little bit more fragmented and a little bit more difficult to, to use. So there are there is a lot of guidance that hangs behind this as well. So when you come into here, if you uh, if you know what you're doing, um, you can you can go straight onto the the calculate your footprint. But if you want to uh, if you want to know more about it, there is there is a good user guide um, which, which sits behind that, and you can download that to, to read at your your, your leisure. So I'm going, for now, I'm going to go on to sort of still calculate the footprint. But one of the important things is uh, that we wanted to be able to search at a number of different levels. Uh, orig originally, we were just looking at parishes, but then we discovered there's actually quite a large portion of the UK which doesn't isn't parished. So we wanted to make sure that we could we could uh, we could capture that as well. So we can now calculate the footprint from a number of different geographies. So parish ward, local authority, and even, and because a lot of people won't know what ward they actually sit in, um, you can actually do a postcode search now. So if you did a postcode, a postcode search on, it, it will tell you what your uh, what your area is then that you, you're sitting in. So um, who have we got on today? Should we do Tarrington? Um, if we type in Tarrington, we get a uh, drop down of, of, of that, so we can then start looking at your your footprint. So it's as simple as that to start finding out what your footprint is. Now the footprint is, um, as it is, we can, we can sort of show some subcategories on there as well. So we can actually start hovering over these to actually see the size and scale of the different parts of the footprint. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are two different, distinct different types of footprints. There is the consumption one, which is what we, we default to in this one. We can also look at this territorial. As I said earlier, these are distinctly different things. So at the moment, the consumption footprint for Downton is 25.2. So if you look at the territorial, it's quite a lot bigger. Now that, that basically means that uh, you're actually uh, you're actually exporting a lot of your, your emissions um, nationally. So uh, we'll switch back to consumption because I think this shows you where your behaviours and you can make the most differences as parishes. But what I should also say, you could also look at your uh, household or local. Obviously, this is just a function of how many people live in your uh, in your parish. So it just gives you a, a different idea. So the total consumption for um, for Tarrington is five thousand one hundred thirty six. So it should be it should just that uh, by how many people or how many households live in in uh, in, in that area. So before we move on, the, the other really interesting piece, the other new uh, piece of functionality is being able to print a PDF version of your, of your report. I think this is one of the things that a lot of people 
um, missed out on in the, the first iteration is that you got, you got all these pretty graphs on screen, but you couldn't really see what, uh, what came of it. You can now print your uh, your PDF port, report. It's very, very quick. Um, so does that, does that come through? So change the, I think it's changed, that's good. Um, so this will basically take the information from that footprint, give you a little bit more background information as to what that footprint is saying, explain the difference between territorial consumption, a bit like I've done earlier, and, and using it as a guide. So this is a little bit of that, what I've already said, but then it starts actually highlighting your individual uh, parishes uh, footprint and telling you a little bit, bit more about each of those, those areas. So I think this is one of the most useful functions that we, we've developed, is this ability to, to have these reports. It also start, enables you all in one place to see how you compare with other areas. And you can, if you like quickly get back to that, you can um, compare yourselves against any of that area. You can compare yourself to, uh, to, to, to any geography, so you can compare yourself to the national average quite easily, or you can compare yourself to your next door neighbour parish. So if you uh, if you having some sort of local battle as to who's got the, the smallest carbon footprint, you can actually you can actually use that to, to encourage uh, a little bit of competition between parishes, perhaps. So that's that's the, the footprint. Um, so that most that the, the most important element, I think, is that uh, is, is that report because it, it it does everything. It tells you everything uh, about what where you could you can actually do things as well. Switching back to this, then, you can actually then start to, to analyze where the main parts of your uh, your footprints come from. Um, again, this is this is carried through into that report. But it, it's very useful to actually start seeing where the the main Comparators are in uh, terms of consumption and uh, territorial emissions. You can see how they, how they, how you might read things differently. So if you just looked at your territorial emissions, obviously mains gas would be the uh, biggest uh, contributor, followed by transport aviation. But actually, if you look at how people live their lives, it doesn't read like that at all. It's more about the consumption of goods and services, what individuals or households actually buy. That's what that's their main, uh, the main impact. Then you start moving on to housing, then you start moving on to their diet. So you can see that's uh, actually, it, it's a much more, um, it's, a, it's a much cleverer way of looking at things if you want to start influencing behaviour to look at the consumption rather than the, uh, the territorial emissions, which might work better for local authorities because they might be able to target where they put investment. But actually, in terms of individual behaviours, consumption footprints are a lot better way of looking at things. Um, you can then also start looking at, as, as I sort of briefly showed you earlier, about how you compare to, uh, to other uh, communities. And then you, are, then you might start, start asking questions, and I think this is one of the most important bits as well, is, is the next step beyond this, is to where you start focusing attention, what you can do about things. So I just go, so this next tab is also a new tab, and this is where you start looking at the actions of what you could do to actually, what, you've got your footprints, so what? That's always been my question, is like, it's all very well having a figure, but what you do about it? I think this is this is one of the important pieces that, that we've added to this is this section. So in terms of what you can do, it gives you a whole list of um, ideas about sharing your footprint. This is, a, this is one thing that I've started to do within within my parish is to um, is, is to write for my local newsletter. I just printed off that pie chart, um, the donut chart, just to give an idea of what's uh, what that footprint means to them, because a lot of people have never seen that before. They've never seen what their footprint of their parish is. So they wouldn't even have a clue about whether it's big, whether it's small. So what? So we need to sort of get that education, get a little bit of carbon literacy or um, energy literacy going in, in the community. And then we're gonna start using that to, to try and encourage them to think about what we could do within our, within our parish. I mean, we, ours is quite, uh, a remote parish, we don't have a, uh, we don't even have a pub in our parish, which is, 
a different topic of conversation. But we don't have a meeting place, really. So we, we need to spend a little bit more time to work out how we can do things differently. But we can start looking at working with individuals. So in terms of reducing their, their footprints. And this goes back to the consumption based approach. So looking at the consumption of goods and services, it gives some ideas about what individuals can do and what you can do as a collective. And then moves through the other sections, so housing, food, diet, travel, and waste. And then also gives some ideas around those territorial emissions as well. So what can the local communities do to, to, to impact the territorial emissions? And there it's about trying to influence the decision makers. So that's, that's us going back to, to our, our ward councillors at, at our parish meetings and saying, what, what are you doing to help us meet our, uh, to reduce our, our footprints? So that's then there's a list of useful resources that are often there, uh, a lot of which link through to other great pieces of work that CSC have done over the years. Uh, FAQs have been upgraded as well, so we've tried to take on board um, questions that have been raised over the last year to actually understand what people wanted and what people want to see more of. Um, and we're also now working to see what comes next. So we've got this far. It's a much better programme or um, website than we had previously. Um, we know it's still not perfect. Um, and we, we need to work with Bayes to make sure that the funding that we need to continue to, to update these figures um, continues to be there. So we can so it's not just a once and done, we can actually continue to use this over time. Um, so one of the things that we're asking all local uh, communities or local parishes or whoever uses the impact tool to do is keep trying to suggest um, improvements that would make to it. So one of the questions today is what else can you do? What else would you like to see it to do? And if, 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 if there are comes a consensus of what we'd like to see, that's when I can go back to, uh, to the funders, the, the pays and governments to say, we need impact to do this as well. And can we get some more funding to, to help uh, make that happen? So I'm, I'm going to stop there. I mean, the tool is is that you've got the web address. The best thing to do, I find, is just to, to mess around with it. You can't break it or anything, obviously. So just keep playing with it and trying to, and if there are any questions that can make the use of it, again, get back to either myself or to, to CSE directly, and we can, we can help answer that. One of the things we do need to make sure is we've got the support for you guys to use it properly. So that is one of our big assets to government is that ongoing support to answer your questions, answer the queries, make sure any bugs that anybody does spot are actually properly on in fact. Okay, so I guess I across to you guys if that's all right, to see what questions you have. Oh, Tim, thank you so much. Um, I really find this tool so user-friendly and I've explored quite a few of them out there. Um, and I've got to say that PDF is a really useful function to have. And I know that's going to get a lot of use. Um, I'm just thinking if I switch my view so I can see everybody. Um, so let's open the floor. I think it'd probably be a good time to, to have some questions while it's all fresh in our minds. Um, if you want to wave a yellow hand at me or a real hand at me, or you can um, pop a question in the chat and I'll do my best to, um, to flag it up. So I can see John there. Well, as you actually picked on Tarrington as, as, as your start point, it's a bit unfortunate for me because for a start, the population that it quotes seems excessively high. We've got 250 households, and I don't think we've got 1,500 people living in the house. So where does the data come from and what might be going wrong there? Good question. I, I would, uh, I mean, that's exactly the sort of thing we need to feed back just to make sure we're right. The data for households comes from places like the, the ONS and the Experian data, which should be pretty accurate stuff. I mean, that, that's that's what we pay quite a lot of money to, to experience it to actually get. So if that is wrong, we need to make sure that's put right. So if you could drop me an email just to, to query that so we can get an uh, absolute answer to you. Yeah, I mean, we've got about 500 on the electoral roll. Okay, there's a, there's a proportion of young children and, and there's probably others who are not actually on the roll, but nonetheless, it's, it seems significantly higher than, than I would expect, which probably skews all the figures, which means 
I don't know what you can do with them. Yeah, I mean, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be incorrect. I mean, it, if it is, then we need to make sure that we've we've addressed as to why that has happened in that case. Without looking into the data that CSE are holding for that, I can't give you an absolute answer, but it will be something I can take back to them to question the population of Barrington and make sure that they've got that right. And make sure that that's not an issue that's going elsewhere as well. So if it's wrong for Barrington, it may well be wrong for Martin or, or whoever. So I need to, to make sure that's not, not the case. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Good question, John. Thank you especially as you're paying so much for this data. <laughs> um, Rod, did I see a little yellow hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a really great tool. Um, quite really, we've tried to use it in terms of our climate emergency declaration as a base point to start from. Um, and one of, the, one of the questions really is in terms of how we can impact it and from what I could see and I may have got this wrong going through where all the data comes from if you do something like getting people to change from oil to gas or oil to electricity the likelihood is that that, that will get picked up through the data that you get if you actually got somebody to turn their thermostat down by two degrees would that be picked up it, it would be, it would eventually get picked up because the amount of energy that's used in that territorial area will go down. Uh, but it would be by such an ease, a small amount that it would be difficult to actually see. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that is one of the problems by um, trying to use territorial um, the, this measurements. Is using, this is using um, not the territorial, the other one. Yeah. Consumption based one, yeah. yeah. And it's trying to get individuals to change behaviours. And I'm just, what I don't want to do is set ourselves up to say, this is the benchmark where we started from, mm -hmm. and then review it in 12 months time yeah. and discover it may have gone the other way because either yeah. it's historically delayed in terms of the data coming through, or alternatively, it doesn't pick up some of the simpler actions that people can take. It, it is one of the problems. I mean, one of the one of the issues that I, that I perhaps should mention is that there is in some of the there is such a large number of different data sets. Some of them have quite a long lag in them. Um, so I mean, the, some of the information is census based. So I mean, there's ten year potential ten year lag in, in some of those those pieces of data. So yeah, you know, things that you do this year won't always be picked up um, just because of the, the data source that it's, it's using. Um, it's why we try, especially on consumption-based emissions, to use the uh, the data from Experian, uh, which is fairly, uh, which does build up from a, from a local level. Um, it doesn't always; it's not always sensitive enough to capture turning your, your thermometer down, your thermostat down by one degree. Though it, it just can't do that. You would need to have um, data from individual households actual records to do that. Um, and I, I think that, that's one of those areas where you need to use the, the impact or as a starting point to put your line in the sand as it were, and then work with people to actually understand their individual's footprints and then see how they're progressing against their individual footprints. But don't then try to add up everybody's individual footprints to try and get back to impact because that would be using that's the bearing apples with spades or something completely different but yeah i think it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a it's a line in the sand it's a starting point but i would be cautious about trying to measure turning the thermostat down by one degree using it i think we need a better more granular way of doing that at the local level uh, that's absolutely fine but could i turn that on its head and then say from the impact tool would it be possible to give us an indication of the areas that you probably can impact. Because if we're talking to people about changing behaviours and things like that, if we can pick, you know, it's about quick wins, isn't it? If you can pick things that are going to show up and make a difference, you know, I think that would tend to motivate people more than if, if it doesn't make a difference. Yes, I think, I mean, 
the ones that always will, will show up, um, actually show up even in national data, are, are big changes in uh, transport. I mean, that's, I mean, we saw that through the, the effect of the pandemic. The impact that had on territorial emissions even was, was marked. Um, I'm not okay, we're going to see a big uptick in the other direction, probably, now, unfortunately. But that, it, those are the sort of things, the big changes in use of transport, which will show through in, in these sort of um, uh, footprint tools. Okay, no, thank, thank you. I mean, it, it really is good. It's just understanding how you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, Tim, you're going to say something. No, I think it's, it's, about, it's about behavior, trying to work out where people's behaviors can add up to the biggest impact. And I think that that's what we've all got to struggle with with, with, our, with our own parishes is, is the, what is the big what is the big deal in our parish? Where, where are the biggest things that we can we can concentrate our effort on? And that will be different per uh, parish. Uh, some of us will have um, more of a farm issues to deal with than others. For instance, agriculture is, is one of those areas where there could be quite a quite a big exporting of, of our, uh, our emissions aspect just because of most of the stuff which is grown in Herefordshire isn't consumed within Herefordshire. So that that's, that's, goes elsewhere in, in, the, in the footprint. So maybe that's one of the areas that the more rural parishes can concentrate on. Thank you. And that's in terms of um, the great collaboration then, it's, it's useful to know that the impact tool shouldn't necessarily be used to review your actions. You're going to have information about carbon coming from the impact tool, but if you're also using the great collaboration, you're going to have information from your communities as well. And those two things may not marry up. Just because you know there's big wins in transport maybe your local community actually are more interested in food security so it's about making those decisions about which actions have the greatest impact but also work um, with the interests of your community to keep that enthusiasm going i suppose yeah. it is why i like the work that you've done on the great collaboration there's those simple things which everybody can do uh, and you can actually amalgamate those to actually work out what those savings could be so i think that it's quite useful useful way next step in a way of using the impact tool to then go yeah. move on to using the, the, the great collaboration tools yeah dream team um nigel you've got your yellow hand up i had um i was looking at uh, well tarrington's was more or less i think the same as ours uh, which is langaran um our carbon footprint seems to be nearly double the national average. And we are a extremely rural community. So uh, without going into the detail, could you just help me understand why that is? We're, we're, without looking it up, um, but knowing how rural uh, counties tend to operate, I would say it's almost certainly to do with oil. You'll almost all be oil, oil heated. Uh, we are 99.9% um, .9 oil. Exactly. And so the same with Stanley Mark Parish. And that is prim the primary reason why we are uh, so high in terms of our average footprint compared to the national average, and that everybody else has got gas uh, as the main heating source. We also tend to, uh, to travel further um, because of the, the, the isolated rural nature of, of our our parishes so rather than a, a, a city dweller we do tend to travel more on a, on a daily basis so between transport and, and heating our homes those are the uh, those are perhaps the two the biggest areas we also I mean, we've also tend to be a slightly higher on, on consumption of goods and services as well so that tends to be another area where we're slightly higher than the national average we just like having a good time don't we? yeah exactly <laughs> But yeah, those are the main areas that we would uh, we would be. Sorry, to be sorry, without sort of going off the tangent, the Herefordshire Council obviously looking for feedback on their new local plan. So are we saying that building in rural areas is should not happen because of that those two effects? That's a good question. Um, personally, I think. If building in rural areas is, with, without vastly improving infrastructure is going to increase our carbon mm. footprints. So if that becomes a planning consideration, then potentially yes. Um, but at the same time, we still need, we, we've still got an increasing younger population. So 
how do we house people uh, if we if we haven't got the developments? But it is likely to increase. Uh, but new buildings though can be can be um, built much better than the the old stone buildings that uh, a lot of us would be living in. So if, if we can if we can build um, new buildings, new residential properties uh, net, with net zero policies in place, so or, or even net negative um, policies in place, then then that would that would that wouldn't increase the uh, the, the, the footprint as much as if we allowed uh, inappropriate development to, to carry on. And we could also then also encourage them to use uh, different forms of heating as well. We could we could potentially look to be doing. Um, my last stuff here. I, uh, we could, and I agree with all of that. However, none of that is happening. But it, it, no, because there, there hasn't been um, this is the opportunity to change the local plan to try and force some of these know. policies through to, to help do that. Um, at the moment. Council, to be fair to them, have got their hands tied behind their back a little bit in the national planning policy framework to sort of force their hands a little bit. Perhaps this is the time where if, if multiple uh, parishes uh, put forward their, their local plans uh, to, to, uh, to encourage Herefordshire Council to put more um, carbon friendly uh, policies within their planning uh, documents, maybe this is the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Stop that now. Thanks, Nigel. Really good questions there and um, lots of opportunities to band together if you are um, notoriously on oil <laughs> and to kind of get those get those local plans sent up the ladder. Um, Jill, have you got your hand up? There you go. Um, yeah, just going back to this business of building in rural areas again, um, you talk about, I mean, is there a on this tool, is there a sort of what what if? So you can say, what if we built 40 houses and have another 20 vehicles um, coming out of the village? What in, impact is that going to have? Because they talk about engaging the local planning department. How do you do that? This tool doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, that might be one of the things that we could, we could put in place in the future, potentially. Um, what what you I mean all the data behind it you could potentially put some scenario planning in I don't see why you, you shouldn't be able to uh, I mean I, I've I've seen all the, the data that, that comes from the the, the information leads to give back to, to government so that you you could put that level of um, scenario planning in it well, um, um, that may be one thing to, to, for us to send back to CSE to see whether that could be something that they could, they could do. But at the moment, it can't be that. Yeah, that's a shame because that, I mean, I, yeah. I, I keep mentioning this all the time that, you know, what about the carbon footprint? But I've got no evidence for it. But yeah. it's just so obvious. I mean, I'm in Cannon Pine Parish. So mm. we're eight miles from Hereford, eight miles from Leominster. There is no employment in Cannon Pine. Well, there's very little employment around here. So everybody who settles here has to drive to town and back and there yeah. and back. And, you know, there seems very little reason for people to live or to expand the development in Cannon Pine because you're just going to burn up fuel going to work and back every day. But how can I prove that? I mean, that could be proven on, a, on an individual basis. You could you could calculate what the individual's footprint is in that respect, and then do some um, feedback calculations to work out what that might look like for the, the population of the um, of well, the population of Cannon Pine now compared to what it would be in the future with twenty plus more houses. You could do some calculations like that. Um, but that would be on an individual individual basis. The tool at the moment can't help you do that. That's a shame. Back to the old fag packet then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think it's, it's useful to have. I, I mean, I, I know I'm still going to have to do fag packet calculations all, all the time to look at uh, what the impacts are going to be. But I still think this is a useful thing to be able to base that on. I mean, you know what the tonnage is for the pine now. You know what the house how the footprints are going to be. So you could. By doing fact back calculations, that, that's on or take it off of the 25 point, whatever it might be, um, mm -hmm. 
to actually help you sort of put some um, put some flavour onto some of the, the, the perhaps more bland statements that you might put back into Herefordshire Council. Yeah, okay, thank you. Brilliant, great question. And um, I think, Reg, I saw your hand next. Yeah, hi. Um, question for Tim. Um, what support is there for any communities that want to get into renewable energy projects? I mean, I've had a look at this from our local parish perspective in Erdersland, and we have a, a significant resource running through the middle of the parish, parish in terms of renewable energy from a hydro project that we could run on the river. But there's all sorts of obstacles in terms of ownership of weirs, in terms of energy mining rights, in terms of putting energy back in obstacles, in terms of putting energy back into the grid, all, all sorts of problems that are just way beyond anything like a small group of volunteers on a parish council being able to deal with. So what support, I'm asking what support is there, and I'm thinking in terms of of project management, I'm thinking in financial, I'm thinking legislative, legislative, um, and any, and, and any other resource, really, that's available to get these sorts of things running at a local level? Yeah, very good question. One of the, I'm coming back a little bit from, my, uh, from, from what I was speaking about now, one of the things the Midlands Energy Hub and energy hubs across England are looking at is trying to support local communities to develop schemes. Up until, uh, well, we just, just ran out of funding for it for the time being, there was a scheme called the Rural Community Energy Fund, which would actually enable local communities to um, engage a consultant to actually work out what the, uh, what the technical constraints are in, in a particular area and see what can be done about it. That, I think I might have met one of your colleagues in Erdersland to talk about the weirs there um, a few years ago, but I don't think anything actually came of that. Um, but yeah, so there is a need to sort of understand that, and I think local authorities are trying to see what support they can provide, uh, but it does cost that bit of money to get a consultant in there to, to see what is viable um, for um, water is, is, a, is a classic example of something which you need quite a lot of it, and you need to make sure that water is there all the time, you need to make sure there's ongoing management of that site to make sure that it, it can work. Um, now that has been done elsewhere in the country and through the Yarsa project. There's a uh, project over in Nottinghamshire which worked out how to reinstate one of its old water wheels on, uh, on a weir, a little bit bigger than Erdersland, but that sort of uh, work has been carried out now. It could be that we can use, well, it will be that we can use the learning from that project if necessary to look at what goes on in Erdersland. There is a need also to consider the bigger issues that are going on in, in the, the energy world. Um, the constraints on the network, uh, you're possibly all aware, but uh, Western Power Distribution are the, the, the company that's responsible for all the, the lines and uh, moving the, the electricity around our region. All of their substations at the moment are at capacity. You can't really easily add on a lot of new uh, big renewable um, solar farms etc in the in the area without spending millions of pounds upgrading the infrastructure that's there uh, and that's something which the, the cost of that falls on the developer not on to, to the uh, the dno the western power so we, we are trying to work to see what other options are available rather than just always spending vast amount of money on infrastructure what else could be done one of the interesting things we've, we've recently sort of worked out, and this is something we're trying to learn from from other parts of the country as well, is that if you take the, um, if, if you take a better, a better insight of the, uh, of the energy being used, so if you monitor things better, you can actually increase the amount of energy that's available from network by about 20%. So where at the moment we're at capacity, we could actually, if there has to be 20% under capacities, we could have a lot more renewables going onto the system if we only managed it better. And that's something the Energy Hub and the stuff talking with um, Western Power and Scottish uh, and Power Energy Networks in Shropshire as well. To see what we can do in the March is to, to release some of that uh, the plan, if you like. 
So there's still pressure to be put on the DNOs, onto, uh, onto government again to, to make that happen. And the off are aware of the issue. Um, and with the, spike, with the spiking uh, prices of energy at the moment, it's, it's actually become more and more apparent that we need more and more renewables to, to enable that to happen. To let that happen, the infrastructure's going to be better. Yeah, th thank you, Tim. It is a, it's a, it's a very, very difficult thing to get going, but I, I, it could be a, a really significant contributor to, to zero carbon energy um, in the future if we could just release the energy that's all around us all the time anyway. Absolutely, yeah. It's the simplest thing to do, especially if you can keep it behind the substation, if you like. If you keep things... We don't have to mess around with best and powers, block wires and, and substations and things like that. Then they're not so worried about it. Um, it's only when you go back into substations that it gets really, really costly. So if we can work at local community projects, they'll generally be more um, helpful uh, and less expensive than trying to do big things which require massive lines coming over from Detroit, which or wherever. Thank you, Tim, and thank you, Reg. That's a great question. Twenty percent is, um, mm. yeah, is a lot. Um, Liz, did I see that your hand was up there? Uh, yes, we've moved on a little bit. I, I was thinking about the um, discussions around building in rural areas, and as well as just looking at the effect of houses, it might be interesting if if you could look at the effect of building houses with some form of green heating, you know. Um, and the effects of installing a decent bus service. Uh, you could actually end up better off if you had more people using a decent bus service. But it's just looking so that the, the need for the infrastructure um, could be taken into account as well and how that might affect the overall impact of building more houses in rural areas. I 100% agree. I think the infrastructure in rural communities is it's not uh, conducive to to, uh, to using a lot of them, um, so we, we do need to, to look at that. And, and from a parish council point of view, that's something that I think we should continue to press um, Hereford Council for as well. So I I, I think we, we need to keep the pressure on to, to make sure that new policies when they're developed consider uh, net zero as, as at their core, really. Yes, they always say that they they look at uh, the cities because they get the biggest bang for their buck sort of thing but then they still want to build in the rural areas without uh, investing in them yeah absolutely and um, yeah i okay, we've had a moratorium on, uh, on developments over the last year or so or couple of years um but that is likely to, to, to go but we still need the, the infrastructure to, to help us put more development in and, and enable people to be able to move around properly so Brilliant. I'm, I'm hearing a lot about um, it's not just what local councillors can do in their small communities, it's about how we communicate with um, Herefordshire County Council as well. And I think that's really something that we can all step up to a little bit more. And, you know, it's not just our little patch of land, it's looking at the county as a whole and putting pressure um, and pressure on those people who can make the changes, even if their hands are tied. <laughs> Well, these, these changes are happening sort of at the moment. I mean, now is quite a prime time to sort of try to influence county council. Um, so I, I think we should definitely be trying to, yeah, to do that. Yeah, the thing they want to hear it. They want to hear it as well. So, um, and you, you're right, you, most of them are pushing against open doors. I mean, they, county council have got a very ambitious net zero policy, I and mean, that net zero by 2030 for the whole county. Is, is, not a, uh, is not a simple thing to, to achieve. It can't be achieved without all of us around here um, doing our part. Um, and it involves all of our constituents as well. So it, it will not happen unless they put in place the policies within their, their plan documents to, to enable that to, to happen. That's not just planning, but it's also their, their local transport plans and all of their, their plan policy, all of their policies need to have net zero embedded at the heart of them. Brilliant. And, uh, oh, Helen, you've got a question. I'm just going to say that in my local community, we've got a kind of little completely unofficial car club. So um, car sharing, really. So there's 10 households that now don't have their own car 
and we have five shared cars and calculating our carbon footprint we've got down to that kind of more urban carbon footprint for transport rather than the rural footprint um, and I know Herefordshire Council are doing something to encourage and, and to kind of seed some funding for more carpools and car clubs and I think that could be a really important part of the solution for rural areas and um, because we know you know in better rail services is only going to affect quite a you know just some particular a particular city and some particular towns in Hereford and then and then buses um, it's always going to be difficult to get the economy of scale to make those really work but I'm really interested to know whether maybe that that spatial strategy work that's going on at the moment maybe can work out the places that can be made big enough to really support a really proper bus service where people be able to get to the, the beginning of their morning shift and get home at the end of their you know early morning shift or whatever um, but then also um, all the places along the route into Hereford or into Lentzel Road will then benefit from that better service. Um, so I don't want to be dead against, you know, completely against um, maybe having some development in a, in a place that then might finally get that proper bus service happening. Oh, that sounds like a great project you've got, got going there. I mean, that, that could be something that other people could learn from. Um, I mean, that's probably the other thing that we need to, to, to work more at is, is the case studies. On, that's, that's another area that CSC are working on is to, is to come up with um, some, some exemplar projects that have gone on around the UK to sort of show what communities have used the tool to their, to, to their benefit. So it could be that uh, if, if we can find some really good examples within Herefordshire that we can we can promote those across the across the UK and vice versa. We can learn from what other what other um, communities have done as well. So hopefully, I think I think they're looking to do five in the first place. But there's no reason why we can't do a couple with CSC to put some uh, some more in place as well. Brilliant. It's um I'm just thinking as well in terms of the great collaboration. Collecting stories like this is vital to so we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and actually something that I've started to do, and I'd be really interested in the chat actually to have your feedback on this, is thinking about um, the changes that we can make at the parish level and those behavioural changes and how we go about plotting our um, carbon descent plans. I'm kind of thinking there's, uh, there's a series of themes coming out here, isn't there? You know, you've got, you've got your housing theme, your transport, all of the themes that the impact have and mirror the themes that are in the great collaboration. And I feel like from, from my perspective, with access to all these people who are experts in their field, wouldn't it be interesting to hold a series of workshops where we focus on, say, transport, and we look at the actions that can be achieved at a local level and case studies and examples of good practice. So if, if you think, uh, this has just popped into my head just now, but if you think that as a local councillor, a series of workshops where we look at actions like examples of, of how to set up a car club or car share, um, how to, um, you know, how to kind of reach your communities and communicate with them. If, if a series of workshops like that, where you have tangible actions that you can um, learn from each other with, if that's useful, then please just put a little note in the chat form and it's something that I can investigate and start working on. Um, Jennifer, I think you've got a question. Yes. Well, yes and no. Um, I did have a question, but I was just going to say, uh, and you, you've actually reiterated, Liz, Liz Buller and myself, we are from Wellington Parish and we had just started out onto this journey. So it's, it's, it's very encouraging to um, hear so much optimism and the big things and the little things that are happening. We've already talked to Martin and Rod and, and David, but um, it would be very useful to have a kind of a group that we could on the back of. I mean, we've no idea. Actually, we have great plans or great thoughts, but there are the, the, the big issues. Yes, let's put a wind turbine in or a, what was it that we were talking about, Reg? On the, oh, way, yeah, the yeah. Yeah. hydroelectric. <laughs> or is it just to stop them using plastic shampoo and have 
soap instead. You know, it's that kind of thing. And so my question, I suppose, is how do we use at this stage in our development, which is no development whatsoever, um, how do we, what two steps should we take using this information, this impact um, website to actually start the whole ball rolling? Okay, Jennifer, I'm just getting really, really excited now because it feels so when we started the great collaboration, we used to have forums where where people would drop in and have a little conversation. But I started these, to be honest with you, when the tool had just started and we didn't have that many members. We've now got 15 local council members and plenty more who obviously we're not going to exclude people, plenty more who would who would want to join workshops like this to share ideas. Like you say, you've got the, the big projects like that, but actually there's a lot that in terms of behavioural change that can be done. So um, I'm seeing some really positive things in the chat as well. So we're going to get cracking on that. There's going to be a series of workshops next. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're also hoping to make sure that our parish council signs up because we are uh, we, we're part of a small working group and um, volunteers, but we work under the uh, we do lots and lots of things in the village, but we work under the umbrella of the parish council because only have a small parish council but we have a wider range of um volunteers so i i suspect you might be getting a check from them soon that's absolutely wonderful <laughs> really really great now i'm loving the support it does feel like um things are growing at the moment it's, it feels quite positive time time to make some changes i think um we've got a few minutes left and i'm going to stay on the call in case anyone has questions about membership or the great collaboration specifically but is there anyone else that um has any questions specifically for tim I don't think so. Oh, that wasn't too bad, a grilling, Tim. No, I thought I was like even more special than that. <laughs> but I think I think my, I was be great to, to see that you are so enthusiastic. You wanting to do stuff, wanting to use impact, or or maybe wanting to come up with your own plans. I think I think the important thing is not to get too hung up about footprints all the time. Yes, they're important to, to know where you're at. More importantly, is what you do. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, it's where it, it's quite it's pretty, it's, it's, it's always this bang and all that. But if it doesn't make you do anything to act to change the way that you as an individual or you as a community do things, then it, it's a bit pointless. So it's only because it can link in so well to the, the great collaboration, which has got I don't know how many, is it 100 different actions at the moment? There's, there's, just over there's loads 60, of different. just over 60. Okay. Yeah, so there's 60, yeah, over 60 actions, which everybody as an individual or as a community can do. And I think that's the, that's the more important thing is to actually work out where the actions are that you can all do. Yes, use the footprint to, to, to talk to your, your, uh, your, your, your councillors about or to, to your local politicians about, to your local members of parliament about, but actually doing, doing some stuff and actually sit recording how well you're doing as a, as a parish, I think that's even more important. Brilliant, thank you, Tim. Oh, Rod, you've got your hand up. Tim, I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to drop this on you, but I, I'm <laughs> gonna have to ask this question. How do you calculate the aviation um, elements of transport? Because if you look through quite a lot of the Herefordshire uh, parishes, we appear to be significantly above the um, national average, and it, it just intrigues me. Uh, right. So, is that from consumption or from territorial? Oh, sorry. Is that uh, from the consumption? Consumption. Well, that basically is taken from the the data that um, Experian have got to sort of understand how many flights people take in an area. So. Obviously, you 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 spend more time flying than other areas. Is, is all I can say on that one. You would um, want to get out of Herefordshire or something. <laughs> it, it, the aviation is is a bit of a, an, an oddball in that for the territorial, all they can the best they can do is take the national average and, and divide it up, portion it uh, population. But consumption based, they also look to see what uh, local spend is at, at the household level. Um, to give it an average for, for the area, and then they do sort of chunk it up. So they don't look at it uh, to see what Roderick's done, um, but to see what uh, the average house in that area has been doing. So they use the, uh, the, the data in that way to sort of build up. So, 
you've obviously been flying too much. No, I, I, it just intrigued me that uh, I, I, do, I would only use the consumption and it, it was whether it was an area that one should sort of engage in with the uh, local uh, parishioners or whether it might be an area to sort of duck because of the level of controversy it would create. Yeah, I mean, that's a personal decision, I guess, at the end of the day, is to how controversial you want to take it. I mean, you, you, you don't want to stop people living their lives. I mean, that's, that's, that's the other thing. You just want to make them make little changes where they can, just to make, maybe take one fewer flight a year, or, or I think that's one of the ones in the... Uh, I was going to say, that's on, one on of the, the actions, so collaboration. It, it would be interesting to see whether many people in your community commit to that action or say they've already done it, or that could, that's where I think both lots of data together, it gives you quite a nice insight into the behaviours of your local communities. Absolutely. Anyway, thanks for that, sorry. <laughs> well, Tim, you are free to go. We are very, very thankful for, um, for having you here. Really, really insightful. And, um, and the questions were great. Thanks guys, really interesting.